this is my still my research today. Uh, so I am uh, hopefully you will learn something at least a bit from uh, the basics of urban planning. So I would like to focus on from form to function. So okay. So before we start, I'll just like to uh, uh, introduce myself a bit. So as for those who do not know me, I am a Harvey. So please call me Harvey for your questions later on. So I am a I am from the the Philippines, specifically Quezon City. So Quezon City is a city inside the the capital region near near Manila. So Manila is here. So Quezon City is just a bit north to it. So much like uh. Ueno is to Tokyo, something like that. So uh, I am uh, 28 years old. For those, who, even for my uh, learners, <laughs> this might come as a shock. But uh, I, uh, I just started my uh, studies here in Japan. So my education is on uh, urban design and built environment starting last year at Tokodai, Tokyo Institute of Technology. So before coming, I already finished my master's in urban planning from the Philippines, as well as my background in civil engineering, both from the University of the Philippines. So that's why I deal with the, the, the connection between the two, the use of civil engineering together with the social aspects, as well as the transportation impacts in urban life and urban planning. So... Before coming to, the, to Japan, I used to work as a, an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines teaching undergraduate civil engineering. I also deal with uh, some uh, transportation projects, so designing some uh, highways, roads back in the Philippines across different areas. So that's some, some I will show uh, later tonight. So what I did before coming to Japan, so as I said, I teach. I do work, and then I traveled in the Philippines. So this is uh, from one of my lectures at the University of the Philippines. This is, you would, if you could believe this one is actually me, a few kilograms before, uh, covered in uh, full, full attire because it's very sunny, much like how it is in Japan these days. So we do field work to talk to drivers, talk to uh, users of the road to know if they will use a different road once we construct or design a new one, or what would make them shift from this kind of, uh, this route to another one. And of course, the Philippines is known for a lot of uh, good sites. So be because of work, I was also able to travel different provinces in the country. So what kind of work did I actually do? So this is just one, of, one example. So here is a province in the Philippines. So the current connection between this point and this point is this one, this road through here. It takes around three hours. So one of our projects is to construct this road, this one. So this one is 100 kilometers, 70 kilometers less than the current route. So why is there no road here now? That's because there is a mountain in between. So as civil engineers, we try to design and, of course, balance the, the problems with different areas as well as the, the need for travel. So this kind of work has given me opportunity to travel all, all around the Philippines. So the Philippines is more than 7,000 islands. So some of these are uh, a good uh, big islands. Some are very small. And a total of around 81 provinces. So similar to the prefectures here in Japan. But uh, because of work, I was able to travel at least by now around 40 to 50 of the provinces. And I will show some of them to you tonight. So two, two of the areas that I've been to because of work, some roads that I have designed, I was allowed to go through some of those provinces. So they will actually be here on this island, the big red one, the southernmost part of the Philippines. Manila is here. So that's around uh, five hours flight from Japan. So we will focus on this island, the beautiful Mindanao Island. So one of the provinces there that I have been to is uh, Kamigin. So Kamigin, similar to how you say come again in English, that's actually one of the uh, uh, theories of how they got the name. They say come again, so they say Kamigin. So where is it? it is, if this is Manila, this small island here is Kamigin. So what, what, is, what can be seen in Kamigin? 
So one of the most famous parks is uh, the, the a sandbar. So you can see here, this is a all year round sound sandbar. You can go to this in the middle of the ocean, swim around, uh, take pictures, of course. Also in this uh, island is uh, what we call the sunken cemetery. The only thing that is visible is this one. Sunken, of course, means under the water. So if you go, if for those who like to dive, I believe some of our learners are very interested in diving. This is a very good diving spot in the Philippines because if you go under, you will see a lot of the cemetery that was there before it was sunken. So there are also hot springs similar to onsens here, here in Japan, but this one, these ones are outdoor. So, but and and they have developed the area so that you can enjoy without getting some dirt or leaves to go through that hot spring. And of course, one of my favorite fruits that you can find in the Philippines is what we call the lanzones. So I don't know if anyone here of our learners have tasted this one. If anyone has tasted, please put it in the chat box, and then we will see if you have a, if you if you like the taste of this uh, fruit. But this one is sour, sweet, and I think some of the uh, people that would taste this for the first time would maybe be interested in the difference of the sour and the sweet for this fruit. So in this province, I did some projects and I was able to experience all of these four. And then another area I think that is interesting for the Philippines is uh, this city called the General Santos City. So General Santos City is located here. It is the southernmost city of the Philippines. This is actually very near already to Indonesia. So uh, what some of our projects that we did here is a highway to connect it to the next city. So that's what we did in this city. Why is this interesting? It's considered the tuna capital of the Philippines. So I think most of our Japanese learners uh, like tuna, sashimi, uh, and you can find here some of the bigger tuna in the Philippines. So to give you an example, this guy is carrying a tuna that's almost as big as him. But when I was there, I could see even tunas that were as big as a washing machine or refrigerator. So that kind of sizes of tunas can be found. Now, what, what kind of uh, dishes do we do? Of course, in Japan, we like it in, a, in our sashimi, in our uh, nigiri. But in the Philippines, we like to barbecue things. So this is an example of what is what can be expected. So this is a sweet style barbecue. And my personal favorite for tuna is this one. So what we call a kinilaw, if you want to read this one, this is the Filipino term, kinilaw, or the English one is, of course, ceviche. So this is raw, similar to sashimi, but we put in a lot of uh, sour, sour component. So either a fruit or vinegar. So hopefully when you go to the Philippines, you can try at least these two, these two areas for your uh, vacation. Now. Some of those projects that I have mentioned are actually part of the Philippine Infrastructure Plan. Currently, there is a lot of push towards having more and more projects, including railways, roads, bridges, where I usually deal with before coming to Japan. And of course, this one, new and better cities. So what do they mean? So new and better cities have better transportation, better living, better job opportunities. So to try to remove the people from Manila and put it in the other areas of the Philippines. So this is called the Build, Build, Build program of the Philippines. Now, why is it important to look at cities? So my, my of course, my own research, it deals with city life, urban living. So actually... This graph shows the population of the world that is living in cities, that is the one in blue, and those that are living in rural areas, so provinces, countryside, the red area. So before, in the 1980s, around 2 billion lived in cities, whereas around 3 billion lived in rural areas. But as of 2007, 2008, 
more people are now living in cities than in rural areas. I think in Japan, it was a bit earlier. It happened around the 90s because a lot of Japanese people moved from the countryside to the cities. So why do we like to move to cities? That is because of better social services. So you have better education, better health care, better transportation, also better jobs, and better information and entertainment. In cities, we have, for example, here in Japan, we, we, we like to have uh, the illumination in the cities. So that's one kind of entertainment that you see inside cities. So, however, there are disadvantages, of course, to city living, as we all know. Pollution is one. There's air pollution, noise pollution. There is congestion, both in terms of vehicles as well as people. Sometimes there are stations that we can't go inside the train because so many people are already inside. And this one is, I think, particularly true for the case of Japan. Very high cost of living in cities. Of Even, even comparing just Tokyo to cities outside it, Tokyo is very high cost of living. So that is because of Similarly, disadvantages. So we have to pay for these kinds of advantages. Because of this factor, we need to study how people live inside these cities and how space affects that living. So that's what we actually call urban planning. Urban planning is actually the design and control of space usage. Basically, there is space, the urban area. How do we use it? The objectives of urban planning is to find the balance between social equity. Social equity means the needs of different kinds of people. Rich people have different needs with poor people. How do we level the playing field? How do we use the space or the city to provide for the needs of those that have less uh, resources? Economic growth, of course, that's why one of the reasons we go to cities, because cities provide better opportunities. How does land affect that economic growth? For example, here in Tokyo, we have here the use of uh, Tokyo Disneyland or the, the attraction sites. The land itself generates economic growth. And then there's, of course, environmental sensitivity. Anything that people do has an effect on the environment. For example, here in the areas in Kawasaki or Yokohama, some of those were started as factory cities, a lot of industrial cities. So pollution was a very big problem because of that kind of usage of that city. So how do we plan cities to reduce these sensitivities? Of course, Japan has a very strong push towards carbon neutrality, uh, reducing climate change, sustainable development goals. And of course, this is one I think that is famous for uh, urban, when you think of urban planning, the aesthetic or the beauty side. How do you plan cities such that they look better, they feel better, they are easier for people to use? Now, urban planning actually revolves around the basic land uses. So the basic land uses is similarly, if you have land, what do you do with it? So maybe our learners can put in the chat, if you're given one hectare of land right now, or one uh, hundred, uh, 1,000 square meters of land, what would you do? Would you put, would you build a house? That's what you call a residential area. Would you put up a business? That's what you call commercial use. Or would you sell it to a company so that they can make a factory? That's industrial use. Now, some of the, I think some of our learners would most, of course, would try to do the residential area. But some areas we have to sell to the government. Why? Because we need schools, we need hospitals, we need rail. So that's what we call institutional use. So sometimes the government takes the land so that they can use it for the for uses that are beneficial to a lot of other people. Now, some I, I don't know if I couldn't see the answers right now, but hopefully some would want to retain the land. Do not use it. Why? 
because, for example, it is near a river or it has a good view of Mount Fuji, Fujisan. That kind of not usage or keeping it as natural as possible is what we call protected, protected uses. So we cannot use everything for development. We have to retain some. I think Japan has a good uh, track record with this one. A lot of areas are retained so that they can connect with the beauty of the environment. Now, for our, our, our webinar today is entitled From Form to Function. So I will show you first the form of a city. So here are some uh, sim uh, common forms of how cities develop. They usually grow around roads. That's the first thing that happens. It doesn't have to be a concrete road. It can be a walking path. It can be a horse path before the older, older cities. So some cities develop what we call organically. It means naturally. So for example, one person is living here, his business is living here. So because of continuous walking and uh, horse riding, this road developed. And then another part developed, this one, they don't want to buy, they don't want to buy the direct line. So they had to go around it. So that's organic growth. It goes naturally. It wasn't planned. Let the people decide on how they want to build the roads. Now, as planning uh, progressed, some, some cities were now developed using a grid or a grid iron. So it's these perpendicular roads that are used. Why is this important? Because, for example, you live here and you, you want to go here. The grid will actually help you not get lost because you just go straight, turn left, or turn left, go straight. It's, it's, it's very easy to navigate in terms of this kind of road. Now, some cities were developed beside the water. So, for example, Tokyo developed beside Tokyo Bay. Manila developed beside Manila Bay. So, what happens is, if this is the water, imagine this is water, the city develops roads like this. This is what we call a circumferential development, circular or radial. Circumferential means this semicircles. And then radial means this us. Roads that go from the center away. If you look at Google Maps later on, try to look at the map of Tokyo, you will see some roads like this. For example, the road coming from the north area towards Yokohama, Kawasaki is like a, this one. It avoids the central Tokyo area. So there's a new highway like this. Or there are roads that connect, for example, Saitama to Tokyo directly. So that's what you call a radial road. Now, in some suburban areas or areas not inside the main city, roads develop like this. So they are in, intentionally have a dead end. Why? Because if you connect these roads, what happens is the people living here, there will now be other people driving here. And if there is a road connect here, so they use it as a shortcut to, to move from here to here. Much like what happens with grid iron. So there is no road that is not used by others. For suburban areas, if you live here, it is more quiet because only you will use this road and your neighbors, not the people who want to go from here to here because they have to go through here. What are the disadvantages to this one? The main disadvantage is if you are walking and not driving. If you are walking, for example, you live here and you want to go here, you're just walking. So you have to walk all the way here, take a bus, take a train. But if the roads were actually connected, this must be a shorter walking path. So there's a balance. Do you want other cars to go through your house? But if you don't want them to go through your house or go through your roads, you have to walk longer. So the balance is, of course, to connect this with walking paths, much like how Japan does it. There are all suburban areas have areas that are only for walking, no uh, vehicles allowed. Now, you might think this, th that these are just shapes. Here are actual examples of these roads. So for example, Rome is a very old city. So that's why you can see the roads are more organic in nature because it, it, there wasn't planning discipline yet. So a lot of the roads were developed 
naturally or organically. New York is a more new city. It was developed after the British colonized America. That's why they already have the grid system. So if you watch some movies that are based in New York or the series, you will say they, they will always ride a, ride, a, ride a taxi and then say, I'm going to the corner of first, first and fourth. It means the first avenue and the second boulevard or something like that. It's usually just numbering. That's because they have a grid, like a piece of paper, intermediate paper or notebook. It looks like that. Now, London is somewhere in between. It's older than New York, but younger than Rome. So what happens is that they have a grid, but they also have the natural roads, similar to how Paris developed. So Paris has gone through a lot of redevelopment. So that's why before they were mostly organic roads. Now, since they redevelop, so they have more straight roads. A more uh, actual or recent example is the city of Canberra in Australia. Canberra is the capital, the current capital. It is a few hours away from Sydney. So this one is an actual photo of the city. It's very nice to look at, right? Who, uh, if for those learners listening, who would want to live in, in a city like this? You can, of course, uh, put a thumbs up, uh, th thumbs up reaction here in Zoom. If you want to live in a city that looks like this, to help you get a better view, here is a more close-up view here. So there is like this one. Would you believe that this uh, water is actually artificial, meaning man-made? Before there was no river here, they had to make it. So. So obviously you can see the shapes, very beautiful circles, straight lines. The problem is the city had uh, high suburbanization. It means people were living in smaller houses, not uh, condominiums. Walkable paths, because they have very large roads like this. The problem is because they have very good roads, they like to drive. So very car-centric is the city that more than 68% or 70% use cars every day because the houses are too small, so they, they, they need more area. So they live here, work here, they have to drive because the roads are too big, too long to walk. For example, you want to go here, you live here. If there was a straight line walking path, it would be shorter, but now you have to go through the circle. So things like that, how form affects the way people live. Of course, a more local example is the concept of the shotengai here in Japan or the uh, uh, shopping street, if my translation is correct. So you have here a street that is not uh, accessible to cars at all. Only people are allowed. So what does this do? It, it actually uh, encourages more people to walk because you can only access this shop, this business, the, the restaurant that you want to go through by walking. So this is how form of the city actually changes the way people live or changes how people interact with businesses, with each other. Now, as a transportation planner, I couldn't resist uh, showing this one. This is one of my favorite Slides. This is what we call a complete street concept. It basically means that a street should be allowed multiple kinds of users. That is because the objective of transport planning is to move people, people, goods, and services, not cars. So we can actually move people and goods without the need of cars. How do we do that? We allow them to bike. We give them walkable paths. We allow them public transportation. So this is the hierarchy of what we do. Uh, this have very high uh, can, uh, environmental impact. These have very low environmental impact. So what we should focus on as transportation planning is making our cities more of this and less of this. Now, maybe some of you are interested in my, my actual research, what I do here in Japan. So my actual research is actually sustainable transportation energy. So if you can imagine what is, what is transportation energy? 
So any form of transportation, whether it be air, uh, rail, land, water, you need fuel. Of course, in Japan, the fuel now is very high, very high cost. So we all know this problem. But we already also know that instead of fuel, you can use electricity. The problem is, even with those that use fuel or use electricity, there is still emission or carbon dioxide, other forms of emission. You might think electric vehicles do not have emission. Of course, how do you build, uh, how do you get electricity? You need coal power plants, you need nuclear energy. Th those still have emission. So the problem is how do we reduce the emissions from transportation energy? There is a lot of transportation needed, hence there is a lot of energy needed. So how do we reduce this emission? So of course, between the two, fuel has more emissions than electricity. Electric vehicles have less emissions. The problem is with electricity, you still have emissions. So what kind of electricity do not have much emissions? Of course, that is your renewable energy. So one example is, of course, solar power. So my research is focusing on, is there enough solar power in the Philippines to power all our transportation needs? Cars, uh, uh, public transportation, trucks. Even if we want to make all our cars electric, do we have enough energy? And can we take that energy from solar power? So that's, that's why I'm currently looking at the the, this is what we call a solar potential, or it means that how much sun energy hits the area. So this is the map of the Philippines. The more red it is, the darker the red, it means the more solar power is available in that area. So Manila is actually here. here. So you can see the, the color is close to red, orange, but this color area right here is much more redder as well as this area. So these have the highest potential. So you might be thinking the cities, the developed cities do not have areas for solar energy generation because you need uh, solar panels. Actually, cities have a lot of space. Where? On the roof of the house, on the roof of vehicles. Sometimes for when people walk, we walk on a sidewalk, right? The where, especially here in Japan, there's a lot of wide sidewalks. What if we can put a roof over that so that we are shaded and that, then that roof uses solar panels? In some countries, they're even, they're even thinking of roads, roads, the pavement, that have solar panels. So even when cars go on, it, it doesn't break. So when there are no cars on the road, it can generate electricity as well. So a lot of free space is available. However, not all spaces are uh, good for solar power generation. So for example, here, it's very green. Here, here. So that is actually because this one is on top of a mountain, this area right here. So there are not, there is not much solar power available. So we can't use that to, to address the solar Ah, the transportation energy demand in that area. So that's why I'm trying to study if how many vehicles are driving in Manila, for example, how much energy do we need and do we have, do we have enough solar power for that? So that's how it, the transportation planning is applied to energy demand and how it affects uh, uh, emissions and environmental impacts. So I hope you learned something uh, from my discussion today. So of course, uh, as an academic, I like to list my references, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them now.